The Coventry music story starts really right back in the Roman occupation and then it goes on to the weights. But really, the thing that sort of kicked it all off as far as Coventry is concerned is the Coventry Carol, which of course is an iconic piece of music. <laughs> itself was first written down that we're aware of in the 1500s, early 1500s. I think we've got a date around about the 13, 15, uh, 1530s. Coventry Cowl itself is rare. It's a very rare survivor. The um, reason why we've got very little written down about it is because it's been lost or burnt in fires. Uh, probably the oldest copy that existed we lost in the fire in Birmingham, in the Free Library in Birmingham. We had a big fire. A lot of Coventry records was lost in there. And so we're reliant on our people's versions of those of uh, this famous story. Right, well people like Annie Lennox has covered the Coventry Carol. Even people like Chas and Dave have covered the Coventry Carol. So many different people. Obviously the Coventry uh, Cathedral Choir have done it, quite rightly of course. Uh, it, it just seems to be a, a song that so many people want to do. So the Coventry Carol itself is is not a very uplifting story. <laughs> it's about Harold going out killing all the youngsters that are under two years of age because he thinks Jesus has been born. Um, he's a threat to him. He's a future king. He's been described as a future king. So this is like a lullaby of the mothers who are losing their children. But I think in many ways we're, we've got to be grateful that we have a version of the Coventry Carl in existence because really it shouldn't exist. It should have disappeared at the back of the Reformation. T. Dunville was so important because he was a major musical star right back in the Victorian days. He was on something like £100 a week and if you look at the, the bill posters he was right up, up there with all the top stars and uh, he always talked about Coventry, he used to come back to the city so it was kind of like uh, like the specials did much later on with King and the enemy always mentioned we're from Coventry and he was another guy that always did that and he was so well respected in the musical society. Oh hello a doodle do. I didn't see you there. Ah yes, Coventry's where I was born by the name of Thomas Edward Wallen on 29th of July 1867 at 32 New Street, right by the cathedral. I can hardly say for certain what led me to a hankering for the stage, but I believe it was a visit I paid during my school days to Coventry Fair. Here I saw various shows including the performance of Pepper's Ghost that had the effect upon me to faint when I arrived home. Anyhow, I began practicing high kicking and various other leg mania tricks to the amusement of the other boys. I luckily secured a place in a show in Barnsley. This was to be my first professional booking. We had an acrobat act using barrels, but on coming on stage, I simply could not lift my leg as high as I required and began kicking my partner in his ear. The audience began to laugh and we finally jumped into our barrels. We discovered that we were stuck fast. The theatre manager shouted for us to come off, but we could not. We were stuck in our barrels for several minutes on stage as the audience laughter turned to howls and shrieks of delight. When we finally rid ourselves of the barrel, I hastened to the manager whose anger had vanished and, to my surprise, asked us to perform for the rest of the week. I had become an eccentric comedian. In 1889, my life as a top entertainer began. I worked and worked all over the country with my peculiar and eccentric talents. It was the autumn of 1889 I was finally playing big London shows. I was billed as the funniest man in the world. My great song of the time was Lively On and Lively Off which tickled the public fancy to such an extent 
that it was the rage for nearly two years. Offers poured in from London and the provinces, even America. Such was my success that I was earning an amazing £100 per week. The reviews were very good as I sang my silly songs and it was packed every night. Mr T. E. Dunville's drollery is as effective as ever and he has added a ditty of the most absurd sort to his list. It seems not a whit too eccentric for the patrons of the Alhambra who rewarded Mr Dunville with a very hearty round of applause at the conclusion of his popular turn. He is certainly both original and innately comical. Hello, Doodle Mary and McGee, go next door to me, dancers in the pantomime. Wears a pair of wings, fold a lar and things, does a giddy serpentine. A week or two ago, went to do a show, fell and burst a watch she wore. Now upon the stage, Mary's all the rage, everywhere she goes, good lord. It's packed, every night, jam packed. Every night, what there is to see, well, I don't know, but from what I've heard, I fancy I shall go. Life is quieter now since the cinema came. Oh, I get by, but I do worry. Yes, I do worry. Well, Rems Dixon was such a huge name in the day, of course, in the uh, 30s, 40s and 50s, uh, a major star, not just musically, of course, he was well known as being a pantomime dame uh, and even sort of subbed for the great George Formby. So he was a huge star in the day and another guy that would sing songs about his native country. He was very proud to come from this city. The 60s in Coventry really uh, were quite an exciting time. There, there was bands like uh, the Orchids, who were named after the Orchid Ballroom, which was of course a major constant. Still is, you know, it's still the Casbah nowadays. So that was a major building and a major venue in, in the city. Then you've got uh, people like Bev Jones, who was the first lady to release a single from Coventry. There was also Woody Allen and the Challengers from Leamington. So Bobby Clark and Brian Lockie, uh, two guys from the area. Bobby was from Coventry, Brian was from Bedworth, or Bedworth as we say around here. Uh, and they both backed Marty Wilde, although not at the same time. Bobby was a great drummer. He was part of the Two Eyes set up down in London and uh, he drummed for so many people uh, including Billy Fury and of course he knew Cliff Richard and all those guys down there and of course then you've got Brian Lockin who uh, was well known really for uh, being the bass player in the shadows he replaced Jet Harris and he came along and uh, he was only there for like a sort of year or so but he was there at a very important time of the shadows when they were doing Summer Holiday and all the big iconic films the, the other bands that were around at, uh, at, around about that time, um, I can remember the Avengers. Um, <clears throat> I can remember a band called Tony Martin and the Echo Four. And of course there was um, John Goodison who was um, <clears throat> used to record under the name Johnny B. Great. Oh, Johnny B. Great is fantastic. Big gentle giant. Um, I used to see him at the Wolf every week, or well, for a couple of years. Gang of us used to go, even took me uncle. <laughs> we didn't have a good time. I used to go to General Wolf in the early 50s. There's the free and easy there, and the most popular man there was Billy Stevens. He played the piano, he was drums, uh, bass, and some of the singers that used to get it were very, very good. And there was that little chap, what was his name from Camden, uh, Frank Ifield. He was... <laughs> now he was massive in 1962, just before we even got started. Basically, I got into the business so young, I didn't even know I was in the business. Um, yeah, it happened uh, here in England, 
Finland, actually. Do you know the first time, can I tell you, the first time I ever yodeled? I'm going to tell you this. I heard it on, do you remember a program, well, not old enough, but uh, there was a program called Big Bill Campbell and His Rocky Mountaineers on BBC Radio. Nobody around remembers that? No. No. Anyway, he was a Canadian <laughs> singer. And uh, I heard this yodel and I thought, hey, I can do that. And I tried it out and I could. I was very surprised. I tried it out uh, when I was helping on the milk run in the early hours of Sunday morning. They were not pleased. I can tell you. My job didn't last very long. It's when I decided that I wanted to go overseas and spread my wings. Mm -hmm. It was natural that I picked to come here because I, I felt that I was familiar with here. And then, and then of course, we had, my dad had relations here as well. And so I thought if ever I came unstuck, I could turn around and say, got to quit. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was very important that I came here. And it also was important because I had made in my mind what I wanted to do was to play the London Palladium. That's all I had in my mind. I wanted to come. And you can't play the London Palladium in this you can you? So I had to do that. I had to come over here to live. And as luck would happen, because what a bit of time. I mean, it's more by luck than judgment. What a bit of time I came here because it was just at the time when, just before the British invasion all happened. Yeah. You know. Those pesky and I was very thankful to be there in the spearhead of all that. It's, uh, you know, if I wasn't, I'd be in, in Australia still singing in all the clubs and pubs around there. But fame is a very peculiar thing. Um, I remember when I finally did get to play the play, it was really because of our interview. And uh, the wonderful feeling of just walking up there, my dream was coming true. And there I was in front of an audience. And it, it struck me that a couple of weeks ago, nobody knew who I was. Yeah. Now here, all of a sudden, it was, it was a, a Royal Command performance on television, and the live audience in front going mad, and I thought, well, this is weird. It is very strange. After a lot of deliberation, I actually joined a band called the Solitaires, and once we'd consolidated the new lineup with me as a member, we decided to ditch that name, and we actually briefly had two or three different names before we settled on the Liberators. It was always a a, a thing to aim for was to play, to be good enough to play on. Reg Calvert's circuit. In about May, April, May of 65, I accidentally got the Liberators the recording contract with Shell Tommy. And we did this these couple of numbers on uh, Stateside record. And Reg was, oh, you can record. Ah, well, when this is all over, knowing that it would blow over and come to nothing, when this is all over, come and see me. So a few, month, a few months later, it did all blow over, and uh, we went and saw him in right lads, you know. And uh, I think it was in the, the dressing room at Nuneaton Co-op, he sort of sprung it on us, right, you've got to have a new name. And uh, he started sort of um, throwing ideas all over the place. And uh, he decided on Pinkerton's colours, but it had to be assorted, although we, we really didn't like the assorted bit. But the reason for that was the fact that there was no colour TV. And it was a, a fashion that started actually in rugby with the, in the early, early in 64, late 63, early 64, where guys would go and get a cheap wait, waiter's jacket and trousers and dye them their own colour and people got, would be known by their colours. Reg Sapp told us from the word go, if you just have the one hit, you'll gradually spiral down into obscurity. It did you it to be properly established, you need three in a row. And, and he said, it, each one gets easier to promote. The problem was, though, was that our second release under Reg 
was Don't Stop Loving Me Baby was really wasn't up to it. It was a good B-side. It wasn't really A-side material. And it was no surprise when it, it didn't go very far. It, it got into the back 26 or something like that. Uh, okay, but the point is, the next one we did was Rocking Horse. Now, if Reg had been around, I think Reckon Roger, Rocking Horse could have been a hit. The tape was actually recorded by Marcel Bavier, who was staying with relations in Nuneaton at the time, but she was from Calais and still lives in France. It was at Nuneaton Co-op Hall on um, Boxing Day 1965. And although it was recorded on a very, very cheap and nasty battery-powered reel-to-reel -reel portable, um, and the levels are obviously stupidly wrong, but a lot, it, a lot of it isn't half bad. And what amazed me most of it all was our actual repertoire. God, were we still playing that then? You know, <laughs> I don't think we had we've got any other live recordings of of any uh, of any of our shows. To be honest, that I know of. I'd actually been there as, as audience. Reg uh, ran coaches from rugby and I saw Johnny Kidd and the Pirates and uh, Billy J. Kramer and one or two others at the Nine Eaton Co. before we actually played there and crikey it was something great to actually get and play there, you know. Reg had a good set of bouncers of his own. But in those days if kids became unruly, the bouncers would smack them. And of course you've got kids going home from the night and co. Oh, the bouncer hit me. So the parents moaned at the co-op. So the co-op said to Reg, you can't use your team of bouncers anymore. Uh, we'll supply them. We'll charge you a bit more and we'll supply stewards. The street doors were open. The lobby was full. The staircase was full. And on the, the crossing of the stairs, one 74 year old guy with a little table. And when things got a bit out of hand, he legged it. There, there's controversy about the actual time, but as I remember it, they announced last drinks. We'd come off stage and uh, Sam, Sam Spade and the Gravediggers were on, actually. And I, I did go up the corridor and I got within about 10 yards of the incident and I found I, I, found I couldn't keep my feet on the floor. I, this is useless. I, I, I'm out of here. And I went. But as, as I went, there were probably people dying at the front because you couldn't see. All you could see is, is that a load of heads. Few people at the very front stumbled on the stairs and looked that weight behind them. They would just got crushed to death. Somebody did something a bit silly on the stairs, caused somebody to stumble, and that was it. The domino effect: four dead and sixteen injured. Oh, God, unbelievable. Tragic. It finished the coat. It was never the same after. in those days it was all the, the, the era of mods and rockers and all that and nearly everybody I knew either messed about with a scooter or a motorbike I wasn't interested in any of that didn't you drink didn't smoke you know nothing like that all I was interested in was every penny I, I earned went on equipment you know and and I think that in turn then landed me a job with the uh, well, I think they were, you, you probably know this better than me, I think they were the first band in Coventry to have a hit record and go on top of the pops and stuff like that, it was the Sorrows. There was a cafe across the road called St Margaret's Cafe. Yes, I remember that. Uh, run by the Rogans. Yeah. And we all used to, all the bands, Coventry bands, used to meet in there at up, anything up till five in the morning for supper or what it was after you'd played, wherever you'd played. And I met Pip in there, I was working with a band called Johnny and the Rebels then. And he, he, I said to him, what's the matter? He said, oh, I'm really fed up with it. He said, playing all this cover stuff. And I said, I'm fed up with it as well. And he said, well, why don't we get our heads together and put a band together alone? He said, I know a bass player. So he fetched Phil Packham in. 
and then vampires are good. exactly, and mm. somebody else knew a drum which was Bruce Finley. <laughs> Where did he come from? Scotland. He <laughs> <laughs> got on the wrong bus, I think. <laughs> And that's how, that's how the Sorrows came about. There were only three members of the Sorrows left when they asked me to join them. The band were on the verge of splitting up because two, Don, Don Farden had left, Phil Packham had left. Pip used to do most of the lead vocals anyway and was the main writer in the band. So it just meant there was one vocal less. RCA Records in Italy, who put the Sorrows uh, Take a Heart, the hit they had in England, 